So I am a registered nurse and I honestly have to say that this career kind of fell on to me. Um, what happened was when I was in college, um, I went into college undecided and being that I found a passion for math and anatomy and physiology and biology, um, working with my advisor, um, we figured that the next best step would be to try to enroll in nursing courses. Um, so that's kind of how I first got my feel for what the nursing field was going to be. And I made that decision after my first semester in nursing to enroll in the nursing program. Um, since I've been in the nursing program, graduating and passing my NCLEX, I found the career to be very rewarding. There are a lot of things that you can do with nursing. Um, you know, you can do hospital acute care, you can do rehab care, you can do outpatient care where I am now, you can do site care, there's this huge opioid epidemic that's going on now, you can get into nursing with that, there's mental health. Um, that you can um, enroll in as well. There's visiting nursing association where you can go to patients' homes and take care of them. Um, there's working with babies. Um, there's working with children, as Dr. Rappo um, does. There's just so much you can do with nursing. Um, I've also taught. I've worked for Northeastern as well. Um, it, you know, as a clinical instructor in the nursing field. Um, so there's so much that you can do with nursing. Um, the, the number of jobs is just endless that you can have in the nursing field. I've also done um, commercials and advertising for diversity in nursing. Um, so there's, there's no end. As long as you put your hand out there and you're reaching for what you want to do, you will be able to obtain that goal. I entered undergrad as a biology pre-med major, thinking that I would go off to medical school and become a doctor. Um, but after taking lots of science classes, um, organic chemistry, I realized that that path wasn't necessarily for me. And um, coming from a Haitian background, there are set career paths that um, your, your family and people around you definitely push you to becoming, and doctor was one of those. Not that I didn't want to be, but I, I also did. But uh, I wasn't aware of a lot of different careers. And then when I went to UMass Amherst, um, I found public health as a major. And for those who don't know, public health is a model that looks at the population rather than when you're a nurse or a doctor, you're seeing a, one patient at a time. But um, public health is working to create different interventions or programs to help populations rather than, um, or laws, policies, things like that, rather than just seeing one person at a time. So once I learned that that was an actual thing, I was like, okay, I, I want to study this and I want to look into this. And um, I ended up getting my master's in public health as well from the University of Miami. And I guess like my career trajectory, what I always try to tell young people is that it's not linear and you don't always have to go into a major thinking that this is what I'm gonna be because life has its way with you and you end up doing other things that you don't initially think you're going to do um, during undergrad, especially because you enter college, you're like 18, you know? And um, even by the time you're 25, you're a completely different person. So your, your desires change, what fuels you, what motivates you change. Um, but the way I look at it is that whatever I did before is just a stepping stone to get me to the next level. So my, I, I do a lot of advocacy around mental health. Like I said, I, I created a nonprofit around it. And my background isn't necessarily in psychology, but I, I'm able to bring the public health lens to mental health, which is something that people are talking about a lot. So that's a little bit of how I came to where I'm at. Um, as a pediatrician, I also have to start by going back to childhood. And growing up in Brockton, um, the world was different back then. Uh, oh, the horror, there were only three television channels. <laughs> there were no video games. Uh, and a lot of the sports that kids are, have uh, available to themselves nowadays didn't exist back then. You did church league basketball, you did little league, and you did boy scouts or girl scouts. And that was pretty much it in terms of activities. But there was always this uh, sense from parents, and Brockton even back then, 
was a community of immigrants. And even back then, the, the parents would always say that they wanted their children to do better than they had done. This, this was always the, the imprimatur, always the, the goal of every parent that I ran across. Um, going to school in Brockton um, was a wonderful experience at the time. I went to the Huntington School. I went to South Junior High, now South Middle School in Brockton High. And I, I, I tell my patients when I see them, you know, somebody you know went to that school, and of course they're stunned because they can't imagine that somebody as ancient as me would have gone to the same school that they did. But it, in fact, uh, they did. Along the way, um, back in the early 60s, the Rockland Hospital created a program that was a medical explorer post. And it was an extension of Boy Scouts at the time. And um, these were people who had expressed an interest, perhaps going to medicine. And it was a wonderful experience because we had monthly meetings at the, at the hospital and they'd bring a speaker in from some discipline within the context of the hospital. And we would learn about medicine. We were allowed to volunteer in the emergency room. And, and obviously it caused some people to say, this is great. There's other people that said, no, thank you. But I think having that kind of opportunity to experience it is, is great. And then I don't know what the right number is for physicians coming from high school class, but there were three of us who did go to uh, medical school and are still proud of our Brockton uh, heritage. I will say that the advantage of pediatrics is you do get to see generations of, of children. My patients have been with me for 42 years now. My babies are bringing me babies. And I, I think as a physician, you do have a level of contact with individuals, with patients that's kind of unique. I mean, uh, we talked about the public health model, which is populations, but the one-on-one -on -one experience, I think, is extraordinary. And, mm -hmm. and I think as a physician, you do have that opportunity to really get into people's lives in a way that is sort of unique. So it's a great job. It, it is requiring a lot of school, obviously. But from an academic point of view, I think everybody in this room could handle it. Uh, and then when I was in high school, uh, my first job was actually at CVS. I was a cashier. And then with my interactions uh, there at the store, I got to meet a lot of the uh, pharmacists. And so I was like, wow, this could be something that I really want to do in the future. Um, so I found a lot of interest in what they do with the medicine. Um, so that's how I, I got into my career with pharmacy. And um, pharmacy over the years has actually really grown. Um, so it started off with like uh, what most people think of, we just count pills, you know, put them on labels. But um, pharmacy now, uh, it's more than just that too. Uh, we do a lot of vaccinations. Um, I do a lot of vaccinations too. Um, and uh, pharmacists now are also uh, taking care of uh, managing people's medications and making sure people are adhering to their medications so that they can get better. Um, and also even some pharmacists have the opportunity to actually uh, write prescriptions. So I think it's actually a really fascinating career that is growing. So if anyone is interested in learning about like their medication and disease states, I think pharmacy is a great way to go. So as a pharmacist right now um, in Massachusetts, it's like six years. Um, in some states it is eight years. You go to um, pharmacy school and you get a doctor of pharmacy degree. Um, and in, if you want to be a pharmacy technician, and assist the pharmacists. Um, there are actually jobs out there that you can actually train on a job, like with CVS, you can just apply. As long as you are 18 and have um, a high school diploma, you can apply to CVS and get training on the job and you can get um, state certified and then you can get um, nationally certified after that and you can pursue that career that way. Um, there's also other opportunities besides retail. Um, there is hospitals and also teaching as a pharmacist. So you could get, um, after your, um, you get your doctorate degree, you can get um, a residency, um, and you can pursue like uh, further careers in the pharmacy like, field. Um, so for myself, I have an MPH, a master's in public health, and uh, my undergrad degree is also in public health. So I've been in school for six years, um, and I'm looking into pursuing a doctoral degree in public health, uh, which would be another four, to 10 years, depending on <laughs> if I go part-time, full-time, money, things like that. Um, so basically, I'm going to be in school for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> so you like school? <laughs> I enjoy learning. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy learning. I don't know if I like the model of school. <laughs> but, um, so I do enjoy learning, and um, I think a lot of the public health classes, so public health is very broad, um, but you can take classes depending on what your interest is. 
So like if you have an interest in gun violence as a public health issue, you can take specific classes pertaining to that, or like global health, community health. Um, if you have a particular interest in STIs or anything of that nature, you can take classes um, specific to that and then go into a career that's specific to that. So I, I knew, so prior to this, I was working at the Boston Public Health Commission and um, I, I learned that I really, I enjoy being a part of creating the, the programs that we implement into communities, but then I, I realized that I also like being within the community as well. So once you start working, I guess you really start to understand what it is that you enjoy, and this kind of relates to my first message, that it doesn't always translate from what you enjoy in the classroom to what you enjoy when you're working. Um, but I, in my position now, I have this great balance of being a part of how we impact people, but then also getting to go into um, the trenches and like serve the people. So we have, for example, um, summer is wrapping up and we had a lot of different farmers markets programs. So I'm not only figuring out how we're giving out vouchers and where the farmers markets are gonna be, but I can also go with my community health workers to the farmers markets and help them translate and um, watch them as they distribute, distribute myself. Um, I would say for someone, for, for my career in particular, a master's degree was something that I got right after undergrad because I could see a, a huge difference in the pay scale between a master's degree and an undergrad degree. And I think um, that's a trend in public health. A lot of people are going straight to the master's or doing like one to two years of work experience and then going back to get a master's. So I, I think um, it, it definitely helps having an extra degree. So for nursing, it's a little different. Um, and it's, it's tricky because there are several ways that you can become a registered nurse. You can have your associate's degree and you can sit for the NCLEX and become a registered nurse. You can have a bachelor's degree, sit for your <laughs> NCLEX and become a registered nurse. Or if you already have a bachelor's in a different discipline, like a bachelor's of art or something like that, then there's something called a fast track where you can go to school for, I believe it's like 15 to 18 months, and then you can get your degree and sit <laughs> um, as, yeah, you know, they, for a registered yeah, nurse. Because they have a lot of what they call accelerated programs. That's correct. Where That's you correct. Work really, really hard in a short, short period, period of time. time. Yes, to get that degree. Yeah. If yeah. you want an advanced degree, like to be an advanced practice um, nurse, that is usually six years of schooling. Um, I am a nursing administrator. Um, I went to school for six years. I got my um, undergrad and then I went back for my master's degree. Um, and so that's the track I took. But there is so many different ways you can obtain your nursing license. Um, so don't feel obligated to go to a four-year school. You can go to a two-year school, get your associates, become a nurse, and then you can go back if it's like financial reasons and get a bachelor's degree and then you can work and then you can go back again and get your advanced licensure as well. Um, so there's different ways that you can obtain that licensure. Before you uh, pass the mic on to Dr. Rappel, yes. can you tell the audience a little bit about what NCLEX means? They NCLEX, um, I apologize, is the test that you have to sit for um, in order to obtain your nursing licensure. Um, so it is, um, you sit, it's, it's a board test, um, it's national, and you have to sit and you have to pass that test in order to become a registered nurse and be licensed to take care of people. I, I felt I was well prepared by my education in Brockton. Uh, I went undergrad at UMass Amherst, to, that's four years. I went to medical school at the University of Vermont, four years. And then I did my pediatric training at the Boston Floating Hospital, three years. Mm -hmm. So if you add it all up, it comes up to 11 years, and it seems onerous. But it, you don't really think of it that way, because college is college, and medical school is medical school, and training is training. And right. you get into training, and actually it's exciting, because instead of you paying yeah. them, they pay you. Right. Uh, that, that's a good thing in and of itself. Yeah. I will say the major issue for medical school going forward, and I think people are going to have to take a long, hard look at this, is, is the cost of, of medical education. Um, undergraduate at UMass Amherst, at the time that I was there, the tuition was $200 a year. 
and it didn't change for four years. <laughs> Medical school for out of status was $1,550 a year, but because we had a contract, Commonwealth of Massachusetts with the University of Vermont, um, it was $600 a year. Mm -hmm. And I have colleagues now who come out of medical school owing $120,000, $150,000. That, those kinds of numbers are not supportable going forward. And it looks like medical education is going to take a turn because uh, already NYU announced that they wouldn't be charging tuition for medical school going forward. So I think the world has to change because we don't want to discourage the best and the brightest mm -hmm. from going to medicine. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I see that there is going to be and needs to be a real change in how people pay for their education. Mm -hmm. um, because like you said, doctor, we don't want to, you know, deter people because Lord knows we need doctors, we need nurses, we mm -hmm. need pharmacists and also public health administrators, mm -hmm. you know, so we want to keep that going, but we want to make it affordable so that others can come behind you. Mm -hmm. um, especially this next generation of, of young people, um, you know, that are looking to get into something. Because I think one of the uh, things that I've heard from a lot of young people is that they want to get a job or get into a career that pays a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear a lot when I talk to young people, but you know, what I try to say to them is that, well, really think about what it is you're doing to serve people, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, making a lot of money. Yes, money's important. We all need to get paid. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you, you want to do something that's going to be mean, meaningful to you and to the people that you serve. I was in um, my practicums, and when I first started as a new um, nurse, um, and I worked at a large hospital in Boston, um, I could not read the charts. It was so hard to read the charts because everything was handwritten. Um, and that included documentation on patients, medication documentation. It was just very difficult for us to read exactly what was the plan of care for this patient. With technology now, like everything is computerized. So it's so easy like to read a note because you know exactly what it's saying. It's so easy to know what route to give a medication to a patient. Everything is just so much more clear cut. I do have to add this little caveat though. It's taking away from patient care. Like all the charting, all the documenting, all the things that you have to do now in order just to be reimbursed. And that's why they put all these, you know, little weeks in place in technology is because they want to get reimbursed <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, so it's taken away from that one-on-one -on -one that you have with the patient. Um, but I think it's amazing as far as safe patient care. There was an eye, ear, nose, and throat doctor. Not an eye doctor, not an ear, nose, and throat doctor, but an eye, ear, nose, and throat doctor who was finishing his career when I started. And I used to go to him to, to talk about what euphemistically people call the good old days, which really weren't that good, by the way. <laughs> but he said in his first year of practice, a lot of the work that he did was just doing uh, mastoid operations on children whose ear infections uh, went unchecked. Mm -hmm. And this is in, he started in practice in the pre-antibiotic era. So it's hard to imagine what that must have been like. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I look around me in the time I've been practicing, the technological advances are extraordinary. A lot of illnesses that I was worried about, concerned about, and even terrified of are gone now, mm -hmm. simply because of, of technology. We have a vaccine for cancer prevention nowadays. If you asked me when I started in practice, we'd be talking about preventing cancer someday. I would have told you probably not, mm -hmm. but that's where we're at. I mean, we have a whole range of vaccines that some of the common childhood illnesses are, are, are gone. Uh, electronic health records, I, I agree from a legibility point of view, are great. From a, a time point of view, they can be a time sink in terms of the data you have to enter. But clearly, uh, having a record that you can actually read is better than having a record uh, you can't read. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess just technology in terms of being able to access information. I mean, uh, the challenge obviously as a physician is that patients come in with two inches of uh, records from Google University mm -hmm. wanting to know, what do you think about this? And I, I find that by and large, informed patients are, are actually more interesting to deal with. Yeah. Um, and again, we, we were talking earlier about different types of parents, different types of physicians, and I, I think parents at a minimum always want to know that their physician 
is going to care enough to say, okay, let me look at the information you brought. Let's see if it actually is something that's medically relevant or something that something you know did in his garage last week. I am very excited about where technology is going to take us in the future. So I actually uh, read an article a little bit before coming here, and um, it just talked about how. Uh, in the future, ideally, we would love to integrate the EHR, the, the health records of um, hospitals and clinics, so that they can communicate with um, things such as the machinery at the gym. So like, if a doctor prescribes one, I, um, I would love to see us moving more towards, no offense to the pharmacist, more, moving more towards a model where we're prescribing um, like behavioral changes or um, addressing access, so uh, prescribing healthy food as opposed to medication or prescribing going a gym membership or going to the gym, whatever. Um, but the article just talked about um, having different machinery communicate and talk to your health records so that if a doctor is prescribing going to the gym, you can, maybe there's like a chip or whatever it is, or a code that you enter um, on the elliptical, and it can communicate with the EHR telling the doctor that you went to the gym on such and such dates and you exercised for such and such times. So I'm excited for where technology is gonna go. Um, I feel like we're always developing uh, new things, whether we actually um, implement them into our health process and our workflow is a different story because you know it's it's hard to go from one way of doing things to a, a new innovative way but uh, I'm hoping that we can actually put things into practice that make our jobs easier and um, a lot more um, just productive in terms of time. Um, I'm excited with all the great things that technology is doing to make um, healthcare like a little bit like safer um, because when I work I see a lot of technology working in their way so they have all these prompts uh, with interactions popping up and little warnings um, and there's actually uh, this robot that actually can count the pills and put the label on um, you know the medications actually and there's actually some stores that a robot actually just counts everything uh, which is really fascinating because that means because we have these technology, now we can actually have more time to focus on other things, like more patient interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, that you know frees us up to like have a conversation and counsel patients, and even these um, interaction uh, things will like you know red flag it in our system so that we can have these conversations with our with our patients. So I'm I'm excited with all the uh, technology. Um, things that's going on and there's actually um, a little bit of a cool fascinating thing that they're testing out they um, made this like a little uh, pretend pharmacy um, and they wanted to see if they can actually make a whole pharmacy uh, dispense out medications and how accurate um, it would be uh, right now the uh, last I've heard it was like 80% accurate which is pretty fascinating that you can run a whole pharmacy without actual people mm -hmm. we'll speak a little bit about um, mentoring. So have, have you mentored people and what would you recommend for our young people? Or not so much recommend, what would you advise them to do when they're looking for a mentor to help them get to where they'd like to end up? I've naturally ran into lots of mentors. So I ran cross country, I worked in high, I ran track, I was very involved so a lot of times Cliff Canavan or Coach Russell, um, Ms. Filkins at the time was one of my coaches, would end up just naturally becoming one of my mentors. And I think your point of having multiple mentors in different um, dimensions is very important because I could go to Coach Canavan about cross country, but then mm -hmm. if it had something to do with navigating the world as a black woman in education, then you know those are conversations that I can't really have with him. So I think that's important. Um, I think, so as someone who likes to mentor now, um, and what I try to do is emulate things that I found great in other mentors is um, I try to bring a lot of my staff with me. So I don't look at it as like they're beneath me at all, but I, I I like to extend the invitation to have them come to certain meetings and sit at a table where most 
people wouldn't bring the staff underneath them too, but I, I always see it as, you know, my position is, I, I'm replaceable, I'm not gonna be at Brockton neighborhood forever, and I want to build the people up underneath me to a point where they could, if I were to uh, resign or whatever, have them come and um, take that place. So I, I bring them to meetings, like I said. I, I also challenge them and push them to do uh, different things. Like um, last week, we actually had a, a, a capstone event here and in one of the grants that I'm working on. And I pushed my community health worker to go and present on some of the work that we've done. So, and, and I found that a lot of my mentors did the same thing to me. So I wouldn't understand why I was sitting at certain tables. Like I would just be like, I'm not saying anything. I'm not contributing anything. Like I don't understand why my boss is dragging me to these things. But in hindsight, I learned that she was modeling certain behaviors for me and then she was also creating a space for me. She was allowing me to find my own voice. She was allowing me to build confidence in what I was doing. So I would say um, someone who kind of sees sees who you are now, but also sees who you are five years from now, is what I would look for in a mentor and what I try to be as a mentor. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, um, the medical explorer post model that I, I talked about earlier was really an ideal mentoring opportunity simply because it was done on an institutional basis and there was real opportunity for looking at a variety of diverse professions within, within medicine. We as a practice have always um, had mentoring opportunities for nurse practitioners. We have relationships with Mass General Regis and Boston College for nurse practitioners. And I, I think that's an opportunity to shape other uh, people who will be doing healthcare. Um, I think the mentoring challenge for younger folks sometimes is we, we've had uh, students from both high school and colleges come into the practice to look, but we found Unfortunately, that a lot of times, the, at the same time they were coming in, so were some of their classmates. And it gets to be a little bit awkward in terms of confidentiality. So we, we really have to take a look at doing it more at the upper collegiate level of medical school level. And I'd, I'd love to be able to do it for high school students, but they keep running to each other. Yeah, that's true. That's a problem. Yeah. My advice when you're looking for a mentor is to definitely look for someone who you trust. Um, that is very important. And don't go for the mentor that your friends you know, are going for. You have to go someone who is looking at what your goals are and what your dreams are and they're gonna help you fulfill those goals and dreams. Um, and I would also suggest that you, like for me, when I was going into nursing, uh, while I was in school, I decided to um, become a nursing assistant or patient care assistant, I don't know the <coughs> correct term these days. Um, and I found people who were nurses where I worked and I had them mentor me and say, you know, what do I have to look forward to in this career? So that's a good thing as well, to try to get into the field, even if you're not a nurse, maybe like a nurse assistant, um, and try to tap into um, their knowledge, their skills, and have them help you, um, you know, to advance. I would say my mentor is actually my boss, and um, he is someone that I really, really look up to. So when there are times when it gets really tough, I would think about what would he do? Um, and he has mentored me um, in many ways. He has given me a lot of advice, because um, he went through a lot of things that I'm going through right now. Um, and I took his advice and it, and it definitely really helped. And it really helps to have a really good mentor out there because there are gonna be really a lot of challenges. And then when you have someone that you can just think about um, encouraging you and you think about their words, it definitely helps you get through all your obstacles and helps you become like a better um, like person and, and like at that position. Um, like right now, like I'm a pharmacy manager and um, I use his words. Uh, to help me manage my store. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to have someone you really look up to and trust, like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, none of us get to where we are on our own. Mm -hmm. We've all had people that have helped us along the way. Mm -hmm. you know. So you want to always seek out those people that you know would be willing to help you and they you know, would support you and like Aisha said, that you can trust. Mm -hmm. 
because I think it's really important to have people like that all around you, you know, as much as you can. So.